coming up on Business Incorporated. Tanzanians to pay more for fuel starting today. State owned firm Ascom records electricity sale decline. And Ghana gets $100 million from the World Bank to reverse land degradation. Welcome to the program. I'm Ladi Williams. Uh, let's uh, get uh, information from the markets now. There was more negative sentiment uh, recorded at intraday during uh, trading on the African continent. Nigeria's NGX shed 0.01%, while South Africa's GSE lost 0.76%. Egypt's EGX30 uh, was shining brightly at intraday. It added more than 1%, while Kenya's offshore index shed about uh, the same percentage at the close of trade yesterday. A majority of investors in the Middle East uh, displayed positive sentiments at intraday. Abu Dhabi and Dubai were on the opposite sides, while Abu Dhabi shed 0.46%. Uh, Dubai added about uh, the same percentage, 0.47%. In another region, both Saudi Arabia and Qatar gained marginally 0.03% uh, each. And now, uh, European stocks advanced this morning after the Eurozone inflation data rattled uh, market sentiment in the region. The pan-European stocks, uh, 600, gained 0.8% in early trade, uh, with retail stocks climbing 1.5% to lead gains, while basic resources slipped 0.5%. Let's get more now from Christy in uh, Frankfurt. Great to have you, Christy. Hi, hello. Yeah, so uh, OPEC Plus, the Organization of Petroleum Countries, is meeting today for the first time since July. What can we expect uh, for the price of crude? Right, so the group is meeting today to ratify their policy decisions for October, and sources close to the matter have said they expect the ministers to go ahead with policy plans they laid out at their last meeting in July. At that meeting, they basically decided um, that they're going to have a plan of a gradual increase in oil production, and this is, um, they're basically in the midst of increasing production gradually after scaling it way back in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. So we're introducing gradually, month by month, is how they've decided to, to go about it. Um, every month increasing production by 400,000 barrels a day. This started in August and is expected to continue into 2022, according to the group. So they'll be ratifying their decision for October, and they're expected to continue with that plan today. Um, now, that's not expected to have a huge effect on consumer oil prices, uh, which is a real issue for member, the member, um, the United States, which has been pressuring other members to ramp up production. Um, we're seeing, you know, in, in some parts of the globe, uh, oil prices quite high and the U.S. is basically saying the demand is there, we need, we need more production. Um, now the other members have resisted this, saying that the oil market is currently healthy where it's at. Uh, however, yesterday the group's experts did revise up their demand forecasts for this and next year. So they basically acknowledged that uh, the demand is higher than they originally had expected. Uh, so in the longer term, we could be seeing uh, increased production, and this could mean lower, lower crude costs uh, in months ahead. All right. So 70% uh, of Europeans are now uh, vaccinated, putting the bloc uh, among the world's leaders in vaccination despite you know, a slow start. The EU was uh, initially criticized for not spending enough uh, upfront on uh, vaccines. Uh, what changed? Right. So there's a few different factors at play here, both at the beginning and what's going on now. Uh, the common comparison is the EU to the U.S., which are sort of peers when it comes to this kind of thing, to, to the vaccination rollout. Um, so the U.S., their strategy at the beginning was to just throw a lot of money at pharmaceutical companies uh, to do anything they could to, to get uh, access to vaccines over there. What this also meant that they gave a lot of leeway to, to these companies in terms of patents on the vaccine. <clears throat> 
as well as in terms of liability, basically saying, well, go as fast as you can and, and the liability uh, you know, for problems will, will not be with you, uh, will not be with the companies. Um, so this was one way that the U.S. was able to secure a very large amount of vaccines very quickly. The EU, on the other hand, they were criticized at the time for, for shopping around, for, for uh, basically keeping their budget uh, more in focus, uh, saying you know, that, that they weren't going to pay more than a certain price for vaccines. So this, of course, slowed things down to begin with and allowed the U.S. to get much farther ahead. Um, now, at this point, uh, the EU has secured access to those vaccines. It took a while, but they do have the access now. And in, at the end of July, the, the bloc was able to surpass the U.S. in terms of vaccination. So now what we're talking about is how are they getting people vaccinated now that they have access to it. Um, so uh, one way that um, some countries have been doing this, countries like France and Italy, they have instituted requirements for people to, to either be vaccinated or have negative tests in order to do uh, many of the things that people have been excited to do following uh, the lockdowns we saw last year. Um, so that's going to restaurants, going to movie theaters, uh, concerts, just any, any, any uh, indoor public events where people were required to have a vaccination or a negative test. So this was a huge uh, motivator for people to get vaccinated, especially right. um, because many countries uh, were not offering free testing. So this was a, a, a huge expense for people to burden. Yeah, quite. Uh, uh, to, to burden. So right, this is, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, retail sales in uh, Germany fall, uh, fell uh, more than expected in July after two months of uh, strong gains. Is the consumer-driven recovery in Europe's uh, largest economy, is it losing steam? Yeah, that's a great question. So what uh, Germany's Federal Statistics Office uh, announced today is that uh, consumer spending fell over 5% in July, and that's after climbing more than 4% in May and June, so a big contrast. Um, now, that being said, they did caution that uh, the, this uh, difference is a bit distorted because a lot of shopping restrictions were lifted in June. So that's one of the main reasons for, uh, for this huge change. Uh, the, com uh, the country did see uh, economic growth in the second quarter, not as much as some Eurozone companies due to supply chain bottlenecks, which hurt the, the industry. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, consumer spending is supposed to be high, um, but we'll have to see going forward into the fall. All right, uh, Christy Platson and Franklin, thank you so much uh, for uh, the update. Thank you. All right, uh, over to the UK now. The FTSE 100 looking good. Let's uh, talk to Juliana for more. Great to have you, Juliana. So uh, the FTSE 100 index of blue chip shares has jumped 0.9% to 7,185 points. Uh, that's a two-week high. What, what's driving this uh, rally and how the market's looking this intraday? Good afternoon, Laddie. Yeah, really strong start uh, for the month of September, the last month of Q3, a really important yeah. quarter um, if the UK wants to recover from the, the losses occurred during um, last year's uh, pandemic. The FTSE All Share at intraday is up 0.69%. The FTSE 100 is up 0.72%. And the FTSE 250 is up by 0.52%. In the currencies market, the British pounds down on the US dollar by 0.01%, up though on the euro by 0.06% and up on the Japanese yen at intraday by 0.28%. Uh, There's lots of sentiment because, of course, the furlough scheme, um, which has held uh, the British economy over, uh, gosh, 18 months or so now, has finally come to the, an end, and it certainly felt that way um, this morning on the tube. Lots of um, workers are going back to their desk, and I think a lot of that has fueled sentiment across investors, as we can see on the FTSE index. Right. And uh, uh, pop chain Weatherspoons has become the, the latest well-known business to suffer uh, supply shortages. With, with some of its bears uh, not available, it seems that uh, it's uh, becoming a real problem over there. It is a massive, a massive issue, supply uh, chain shortages is a huge problem for uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government, if not for the fact um, that uh, lots of um, attention is being focused on the ongoing evacuation from Afghanistan. This would certainly be at the top of the agenda. Um, we've had it from Nando's, KFC, uh, McDonald's, and I can attest to the fact that I did go to a McDonald's on the weekend and there are no milkshakes, there are no uh, bottled drinks, so it's really happening. And Weatherspoons, a very popular pub chain here in the UK, 
has um, left a statement for its customers um, because there are two um, beers uh, that are favoured by their customers that are not available. I have to read my notes here. Carling and the Coors brands got a statement here from their spokesperson, Eddie Gershon, who says we're experiencing some supply problems with both Carling and Coors, which means that some pubs do not have products available. They then apologise um, to the customers for the inconvenience calls and say we know that the brewers are trying to resolve the issue. Now, this is partly due to the global supply chain that's happening everywhere, but also most importantly, or should I say politically, is Brexit. Brexit immigration issues is really affecting um, staff. Um, according uh, to some estimates, about 100,000 HGV drivers are missing. They're no longer available here in the UK. And this is mostly down uh, to Brexit immigration rules. Many of them left um, to the continent during the pandemic and they've been unable to come back. And now the government um, are not... Um, listening to the Labour Party or um, retail XX, and they are not going to loosen uh, the Brexit uh, migration rules, which were tightened um, during the exit. So it is a major issue. There have been some joke um, commentaries in the headlines about milkshakes and chicken uh, not being available. But when it does start affecting uh, the school system and schools do start going back, they start opening their gates. And um, there are some concerns that perhaps um, lunches uh, may be amiss. I think that's when it is going to start getting uh, pretty serious. Yeah, we don't joke with our food. Well, uh, Shell plans to install 50,000 electric vehicle charging points uh, across the UK. Uh, what's the plan here? Yeah, this is all part of uh, major British government plans um, to ban um, the new sale of um, petrol or diesel cars uh, by 2030. And of course, Shell, as it transitions away from the dirty oil business, they have pledged to be um, net zero uh, by 2050. Now, one of the major obstacles in trying to convert petrol and diesel um, uh, car users to electric car users is that there are a lack of electoral vehicle charging points up and down the country. And uh, Shell now have uh, teamed up uh, with a company that I believe uh, they purchased called Ubitricity, um, who already have a monopoly on electric vehicle charging points in the UK. And so over the next four years, they are going to be rolling out about 50,000, as you said, um, uh, charging points. Um, at the moment, the government um, offer local authorities 70% of the fee um, that it would cost to build these charging points. And Shell said they're going to, you know, pay the rest. So this is a yeah. great day uh, for them. Good news story uh, for yeah. uh, the British government, especially as I was discussing um, with Inny on Business Morning this morning, that we've now got E10 uh, petrol, uh, yeah. which is a 10% ethanol petrol uh, to cut emissions up and down the country. So the British okay. government way on um, the, 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 the lead uh, to become a net zero by the middle of the century. And of course, yeah. and it gives them some brownie points when world leaders meet in Glasgow <laughs> in November 26. Okay. <laughs> All right, Juliana, thank you so much. Always great to talk to you. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on now, Ethiopia Central Bank has doubled the statutory reserve requirement for lenders to 10%. Lenders have also been directed to start uh, transferring 50% uh, of their, their foreign exchange holdings uh, to the central bank. Compared with 30% previously, the central bank will then give lenders a local currency equivalent of the uh, amount remitted. So to help us uh, shed more light on this, we have uh, Admaya Maparadza, Head of Markets, Southern Africa Times Media. Great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. All right, so um, looking, yeah, so looking at these uh, decisions now by Ethiopia Central Bank, you know, doubling the statutory reserve requirement for lenders to about ten percent. Why do you think uh, this is coming at this time? Um, perhaps we should look at uh, what statutory reserves are first. Then we, we we try and explain that statutory reserves are the um, cash and cash equivalents that banks hold within their vaults or with the reserve bank. Uh, and then the reserve requirements, they will be the minimum mandatory uh, amount of those cash or cash equivalents that the banks should hold. Now, if we look at the brief background uh, of Ethiopia, in the past 10 years, it has been uh, performing very well. I think, uh, well, it's a fact, it, it has outperformed all other 
regional countries in the Eastern African region with um, um, a growth rate of average 9.4% within that period. But they, they, there was a turn at some point last year and the economy is slowing. So um, the authorities there, particularly the, the financial authorities, which are the Reserve Bank, uh, it has stepped in to improve, uh, um, in fact, to increase the reserve rate for, 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 for all the lenders in the, in, in the, in the region. And there the idea is to try and mop up excess liquidity within that economy because with excess liquidity, there will be a lot of cash chasing um, a limited number of goods. Um, and if you look at the, the, the inflation rate as it measured, in July of this year, it was standing at about 26.4%. So the authorities are stepping in to try and uh, arrest that situation in the economy. Right. All right, uh, Maya Maparaz, I will keep tracking uh, that uh, economy. Thank you so much uh, for your time on the program. Okay. Thank you for having Thank you. me. All right. All right, uh, after the break now, we look at uh, more stories from the African continent. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. And you're still watching Business Incorporated live on Channels Television. Now to our next uh, conversation. Consumer prices rose 6.57% from a year earlier, compared with a revised 6.55% in July, according to the uh, Kenya National Statistics, uh, Bureau of Statistics. Uh, the food and non-alcoholic drinks index, which comprised a third of the inflation basket, rose at 10.67% from a year ago, while housing water, electricity, gas, and other fuels index uh, with a weighting of 14.6% in the inflation basket uh, grew by 5.07%. Let's talk to Steve Ogutu now, a development expert in Nairobi, Kenya. Great to have you on the program. Oh, thank you very much, Larry. Excited to join you short this thank afternoon. You. Yeah, so, so Kenya's inflation has ballooned to an 18-month uh, high in August. Uh, what do you think drove this? Right. Um, you know, um, part of the major drivers of this inflation has been largely because of, you know, um, the level of um, investment on capital projects. Uh, right now, the government is focusing, and even before COVID, the government was really focusing on a very massive um, infrastructural <coughs> expansion in the country. We have massive roads that are taking shape here. And so, and you know that most of these projects are actually funded through, um, through loans. And, and, and so what it means is uh, citizens have to be taxed more in order to, um, to repay back some of these um, loans and stuff like that. And um, also COVID again came in, came in and this again um, affected, you know, so many aspects of our economy. The supply chain uh, were severely affected. And what this meant is commodities such as uh, food, um, electricity, fuel, you know, had to really skyrocket in terms of prices. And this definitely had an impact um, in our economy as a country. And I'm sure this is the case across other countries um, um, in Africa. All right, and uh, the inflation rate still remains within the central bank's target range of about 2.5% to 7.5%. Uh, what do you think would be the policy direction at the next meeting? Right, what I think the government uh, needs to do is basically focusing on relooking its fiscal policy. Um, there's need to reduce expenditure on capital projects um, and also... Uh, focus on, you know, uh, increasing taxation on, you know, certain uh, commodities such as fuel, electricity and foodstuff. And also uh, think about innovative ways of uh, taxation. Um, I think those are very uh, key uh, areas that the government uh, could be considering um, in the coming few few months. Yeah. And Kenya is heading to an election next year. Uh, what do you? What's your outlook for uh, the economy going forward? Right. You know, as is the case normally, um, about two years, two elections, and two years after elections, um, uh, Kenya we normally uh, experience um, a lot of heat to the economy. 
because then uh, most investors uh, are afraid to invest because of the, the the high political tension that comes with the election and, and things like that. And so we expect that the economy is going to experience some recession uh, and then peak uh, maybe around 2024, thereabout. So um, we are really expecting that um, in the coming uh, few months. Um, the, stock, the, the stock market, of course, is also uh, going to experience some shakeup. And so uh, we're just getting ourselves ready for these uh, tough times that are ahead of us. All right, I can imagine. All right, uh, uh, Steve Ogutu, a development expert in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Thank you very much, Larry, for having me, and have a good Thank you. afternoon. You Bye -bye. too. All right. Okay, still in uh, East Africa, Tanzanians will start paying more for fuel, according to the uh, latest price list uh, released by the Energy and Water Utilities Regulatory Authority. Authorities say that the price hike is due to changes in the global market. The price of petrol at the Dar es Salaam port has increased by 84 shillings, so diesel 29 shillings, while kerosene says it, its price jumped by 18 shillings. With the increase, consumers will now pay 2,511 shillings for a liter of petrol, Dar es Salaam, while uh, 2,291 shillings will be paid for diesel and 2,194 shillings for kerosene. And South Africa's state-owned power utility, ASCOM, saw a 6.7% decline in overall electricity sales despite slashing debt uh, by almost 82 billion rands for the financial year ended uh, March 2021 in its latest financial result. ASCOM says the slowdown on economic activity due to the pandemic and an increase in operating costs related to the maintenance and repair work on its fleet of power stations and the power grid contributed to the decline in sales. And while the power utility has called its uh, workforce, another more than 2,000 staffs during the reporting period, and these were through natural treason and voluntary separation, and none uh, were forced uh, retrenchment, according to Eskom. The World Bank has approved $103.4 million for Ghana to reverse the degradation of about 3 million hectares of uh, degraded landscapes and strengthen the country's integrated uh, natural resource management. The Ghana Landscape uh, Restoration and Small-Scale Mining Project will focus on land use planning for integrated landscape management and promote sustainable mining by helping formalize artisanal and small-scale mining with over 250,000 people as direct beneficiaries. Cost of environmental degradation in Ghana uh, due to unsustainable uh, use of land for agriculture, forestry, and uh, mining uh, stood at 2.8% of GDP. Project will help boost uh, post-COVID-19 economic recovery, create jobs, and secure livelihoods in some of the poorest parts of Ghana by focusing on agricultural productivity, ecosystems management, and sustainable small-scale mining. And Egypt is set to start full operations of its anticipated commodities exchange in the first quarter of 2022. The Egyptian commodities exchange had already uh, had trial uh, operations in the past, and uh, they did coincide with the start of the wheat harvest. Some 450 wheat collection points were established prior to the harvest time across the country for farmers wishing to offer their harvest on uh, EGY Comics. It is also said to reach a twinning agreement with the Belarusian Universal Committee Exchange to benefit from the Belarusian experience of using the exchange mechanism. Earlier this month, EGY Comics had signed a memorandum of understanding with the abuse during an Egyptian delegation visit to abuse's headquarters. And now Egypt, the world's largest wheat importer and former uh, earlier this year, the, the exchange will aim of, at providing protection for small farmers and producers and making their stocks uh, available to the wider market. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye-bye.